and let's just get started. So I think we can all agree that this 2022 We can all agree. <laughs> that I love Windows. That the 2022 is a very exciting year for like C++ ecosystem and entire system programming language domain, because there's a lot of new stuff happening. Namely, we got a new language, like not new, like 2022, but we have a rapid growth of distinct separate independent languages like Rust, Zeek, and they, they don't claim to replace C++ directly, but they are a competition sort of in like system programming languages because a project that would be written in C++ now can be written in Rust or Zeek. We also have a direct successors of C++, like famous Carbon, which explicitly says it's trying to replace C++, not totally replace, but like replace it in some context, like Google context in this way. <laughs> and we have evolution of C++ itself, new dialects. So not escaping from C++, but bringing C++ somewhere else, like CPP front or circle. So this is lightning talk. I don't have too much time. So I will be just talking about CPP front, carbon, and circle. <coughs> I will be trying to spoiler like a syntax to show a little bit of syntax, because it's hard to talk about programming language without showing the programming language. And now we're talking about what problem does it solve, what it tries to achieve. Because all of that project has been created for some purpose. They don't exist in vain. They are trying to address some very concrete problems that C++ have. And I will mention the maturity of the project, because some projects are just ideas on the paper without even working compiler. And some projects have like years of work behind them. And they're like fully functional if anything is fully functional. So let's start with CPP front. So it was presented by Herb Satter on CPPCon this year, closing keynote. And CPPCon is, as we know, is the biggest C++ conference. And keynote, closing keynote is like the last big talk. So I think it just shows how much optimism and hope is about this project if they decided to put it on the closing keynote. And its explicit goal is to make C++, C++ 10 times simpler and safer. And that may seem like a very ambitious goal, because it's like order of magnitude, but taking into account what is the current state of C++, maybe it's not that hard at all. <laughs> <laughs> so what is CPP front? CPP front introduces a new syntax, CPP2. And CPP2 files, or CPP2 code, is transpiled by CPP front to normal C++. So there's no need for a separate compiler. There's just like it is a compilation to C++. So in a way, it's like TypeScript for JavaScript. TypeScript is also compiled or transpiled to JavaScript, and then is executed as a normal JavaScript. There's no like execution environment for TypeScript. So CPP front is very similar. So CPP front is the name of the tool that does this compilation to C++, and CPP2 is the name of this new syntax. And the CPP front name is not by accident, because first compiler that Bjorn wrote of C++ was called Cfront, I believe, and was compiling C++ to C. So there's like a connection that CPP front is like a new C++ that compiles back to C++. You can write entire file in C++ 2 syntax, or you can mix C++ 1 and 2 in one file. And the idea is to make it easy to innovate improve language, because you don't need to change the standard, and we know how. Changing the standard is not easy. You don't need to change the compilers. You just put like one layer of abstraction <coughs> above, above your code. It's like a next, just next tool in your already pretty long tool chain. And what can be done during this compilation from C++ 2 to CPP? Like all the defaults can be made right this time. <laughs> Variables can be const. <laughs> Functions can be non-discard by default. We can remove a lot of parts because one of the if like one of the goals was to make C++ 10 times simpler. And it's very easy to make language simpler by removing all of the unnecessary luggage, like all of the historical, like, hist historical inheritance. We can just remove the parts like union or row pointer arith arithmetic. And we can improve memory safety, because like this is a compilation to C++. We can enforce some very strong static checking. We can enforce CPP core guidelines. 
So to show some of the syntax, uh, one of the yeah, universal time declaration is this time they really want to have something universal, not like uniform, uniform initialization. So it should be universal for every single type. So you have name, then you have a type, and you have value. So for simple objects, you have like name, type, value. Then also for the classes is the same syntax because defining a class is like introducing a new type. So the type of the class is the type itself. So the name, type, type of the class is type, and then the value, empty class. And functions. Name of the functions, then there's a type of the function. It looks like lambda, but yeah, this is a type of the functions, and then the body of the function. There's also some interesting proposals which, which have been proposed to the standard but haven't been accepted yet, like the in-out parameter. So let's say it's about if the parameter is to read from or to write from, and it's like one layer above uh, the normal syntax, like taking by const reference or uh, taking by normal reference, and then it will be compiled to like const reference or like normal or value depending on the CPP front. And there's also interesting syntax for the templates. Because if we specify that the type of the parameter is underscore, so it can be any type. So any type is just a template type. So it's just much shorter syntax. How do you indicate that they need to be the same type? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure there, I'm sure there is a way. Right. I'm sure there is a way. <laughs> yeah. But one of the purpose was to make C++ simpler, much simpler for us developers, and also much simpler for teaching new people, for the people who are entering the field. So the syntax is supposed to be much easier to parse, and much more uniform. And the maturity of the project, like this project has been announced this year, but Herb Satter has been working on this for at least four years, according to what he was saying. And the project is, is already ready, like functional. You can test it on the Godbolt. And you will not get it compiled to like executable, but if you go to the Godbolt, you will, it will compile to normal C, C++. So you can have a CPP2, and it will compile to normal uh, C++. Next, Carbon. This was presented also this year at CPP North. And this is the language that officially claims to be a successor of C++. It comes from Google, <laughs> but it aspires to be community-driven. It knows that Rust is very successful because it is a community-driven language. Like No one thinks of Rust as, oh, Rust is from Mozilla. It's Mozilla language. It's not a Mozilla language. It's like a community language. At least this is what most people feel. So Google tries really hard to hide, hide its own name be be behind the carbon <laughs> and to involve a lot of people into the language development. So if you. If you are creating a new language, you must have very good reasons to dislike C++. So what Google doesn't like about C++? They claim it's very difficult to improve C++. Because it's so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> True. <laughs> There's a lot of technical depth. Backwards compatibility holds the language back. And something happened. And ABI stability is a blocker for performance improvement. So Google is very unhappy about keeping ABI stability because they want to get every performance they can. And in C++, there's a slogan that you pay for you only for you what you use. And we are using backward compatibility, and, and we are paying the price for it. Like We cannot break ABI, and a lot of companies don't want to break ABI. But Google really wants it, because like saving 1% of time on the unordered map is like a millions of dollars at their scale. And they are really pushing to be on the bleeding edge of the technology. They don't have many dependencies because they, they don't have many third party dependencies because everything belongs to them and they build everything from source. So they don't really care about AB stability. They can just rebuild every dependency. So, what Carbon aims for is to be high performance language like C, be easy to evolve. Like Google doesn't really like the standardization process. <laughs> <laughs> Break ABI when it needs. Like carbon is meant not to be stable. Like it w if it needs to break ABI to be more, per more performant, it will break ABI. It's like and break API as well. This is explicit known goal of carbon to have a stable API. They say explicitly we will not have stable API. We'll break ABI and API whenever we need it. If we if it's improvement for language, 
And if you are st the yes, <laughs> and if you are staying behind on old compiler, that's on you. But like the carbon is moving forward, it must go for every single performance it, it can get. But they do promise that when they break API, they will try to provide some tools for you that will transform your code automa automatically <coughs> to a new syntax. But this says a lot about this shows what are the goals of the carbon. So everything. Like the C++ has at it its host its backward compatibility. Like no backward compatibility at all in the carbon, pretty much. No API stability, no ABI stability. I, I think you should, you should have put a second heading partway through. What carbon aims for the first two points? What carbon doesn't aim for? Yeah, the true. The <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah, so carbon wants to be very optimal language. They, they don't want to be held back by the history like C++ is. And there is a famous question, why not write everything in Rust? And this question was asked during the Carbon presentation. And they said, if you can, just use Rust, because it's awesome language. But Rust has its problem that it's very hard to migrate a huge C++ code base to Rust. You cannot call the Rust directly from C++ and the other way. Like You can use like C API and extern C everywhere, but it's hard to inject the Rust object file by object file into your huge existing code. So the killer feature of Carbon is interoperability with C++. This is like the main feature. This, is, this reason is why they created a new language. To make a language that is very easy to make a new, to develop existing project with Carbon. So that belongs on that slide a few slides back, which is the goals of Carbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to leave it for later. <laughs> so as an example, how to call C++ from Carbon? So we have a C++ like a C structure, but let's pretend it's C++ in a header person.h. Then we have a carbon file. And we can import directly C++ headers. And when we import C++ headers, it will create automatically a carbon module. And then we, can, we are able to access the members and do all the operations we should be able to on this. So this is like automatic transformation. You can just include your C++ existing files and call this functions, refer to the fields, member fields, and the other way around. This clearly looks like a poorly designed person type, because it, needed, it clearly needs another member, which is the pronoun. <laughs> yes, <laughs> true. <laughs> it's pronoun yeah, I mean, I was trying to be safe here. <laughs> and the other way around, calling a carbon from C++, it's also quite simple. If we write normal carbon code, every carbon code will generate an artificial syntactically synthesized header in C++. Like this header, person, dot, uh, person carbon H, is not created by us. But if we write C++, then the carbon compiler will, for every C++ module header will create an artificial header. And then we can use this inside the carbon. So this is very nice interoperability. Maturity of the product, oh, it's early stage of language design. Like There is no working compiler yet. They have published, <laughs> yes. This is funny, but they have published it very early because they really want to get the community involved. And they have dragged a lot of people from C++ ecosystem, like Kate Gregory, for example, who are working really hard on the compiler. And more, not even the compiler, more the design of the language. So it's like a product for years. But it will be coming there, probably. We know how Google likes to kill the products. <laughs> well, except when they get their ADHD attacks and they just totally forget about it. Halfway. Yeah. Yeah, but they seem pretty invested. Like, they already spent a couple of years. That's what they claim. And they still don't have compiler. <laughs> the problem is that's never stopped Google from going, yeah, now we've lost interest. We're going to do something else. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. And the last uh, topic is circle. This is a C20 compiler written from scratch by one person, from Baxter. And it extends C by adding many novel features. So, this is not approach to create a new language, this is approach to incrementally improve C. There is a strong faith and belief behind this compiler that we can improve C and we don't need to throw it away, which is very optimistic <laughs> and hopefully true. So assumption C++ can evolve incrementally into much better language. And I will show the syntax. There's a lot of cool stuff in like templates and uh, reflections. 
So for example, pack subscript, we can have a template pack, t foo, and then we can refer to each element by index and even negative index iterating from the end. We can have the pack slice. So we can we, ha we have like the beginning index, in beginning index, end index, and the step. So if we have just the step minus one, then we iterate the reverse. We can, yes, it's very Pythonish. It's very Pythonish. Then we can iterate for our odds by by having a step two and starting from index one. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So like, it unpacks t, so you get types. How how do you see out the types? Uh, I don't know. I mean, this, <coughs> this is, yeah, this is just printing elements, right? It's iterating over the elements. So the elements of the, of the pack. pack. Yeah. Cool. So the elements of the type pack are types. Yes. No, uh, no, it's over the elements, not over the types. So the elements of both? Okay, now I'm confused. <laughs> well, so you've got, a temp you've got template parameters that yes. are a sequence of T. Yes. And you've got function parameters that Which are sequence first yes. types matching T. Yes. Um, and our C out appears to be taking the types, not the not the foods, if you should I mean. All right, you're right. Yes, yes, yes. Is that what yes. You're yes. Yeah, so I yes, <laughs> it does iterate over the types, not over the elements values. Yeah. Okay. And then there are Yes. Think of. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of compiled time, so. Yeah, that, that's yeah. correct. It's very like compiled, features focused. So reflections. So we have a structure to strings, char and int. <coughs> we can print the name of the type, which is nothing super fancy. But we can also use the reflections to g iterate over like the members. We can have the number of the members, member count. Then we can have the member name, a member name here, and member type. And this would print something like this, which is super cool, I think. So those are like real reflections in C++, and it actually works. Yeah. And this is already working compiler. There's a web page for it. It's also in Godvolt, so you can just play with it. It's a fully working project. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But to be fair, he quitted his job to do this <laughs> because he didn't have he enough free time. Yeah, and he Just took. <laughs> yes, and it took him like f two or three years. <laughs> and that's it. Any questions? If not, thank you very much. <laughs>